Ross, thank you for taking some time today to do a deep dive conversation on our licensing progress and some updates. As the Director of Regulatory Affairs, you handle a lot of licensing items. So by the time this conversation goes live, we would have submitted our licensing project plan. Why don't we start there? What is a licensing project plan and it, why is it important in terms of of our future licensing um, applications. Sure, Benita, and, and thank you for having me here and to talk on this topic. Oklahoma's licensing project plan, or otherwise called a regulatory engagement plan, is really a description of the key interactions that OCLO intends to have with the NRC to ensure alignment on key licensing and policy-related matters, specifically in pre-application. It's intended to be an iterative plan that's informed both by OCLO's identified engagement topics, which are important to have focused conversations on in pre-application, as well as experiences and lessons learned through uh, through these pre-application engagements. It's our goal from a company perspective to have intentional pre-application, and that is tailored to the feedback necessary to ensure we are incorporating feedback from the review staff as we finalize submitting our next application. Importantly, this includes things like accounting for key feedback we've received during the review of our previously accepted combined license application for the Aurora Powerhouse, which we'll be updating uh, to be more explicit in how each item raised by the NRC is being resolved through the licensing project plan and through pre-application engagements. We want to make sure that we're, we're very explicit in how we communicate the lessons learned. The staff um, has, has communicated to us that they're, they're ready to pick up on the review from where they left off, but critical in that is making sure that we address and resolve key key staff feedback that was provided to us through the review of the previous application. So much goes into the licensing space. And that's why I think having this conversation, it's really important because there's so much that goes into it. And while we're on the topic of licensing, I also think that it's important to address the fact that we are trying to license what's called more fast vision technologies. It's actually a technology that the NRC is not used to licensing. The NRC, of course, has extensive experience licensing light water reactor technologies, which look and operate very quite differently compared to fast reactor technologies, which is what we're trying to license. So I know you have worked at NRC before, and so having experience working there, can you elaborate on some of the background in terms of the existing regulatory framework that were actually developed based on light water reactors? Yeah, certainly. As you mentioned, the existing framework for licensing nuclear technologies has largely been founded on the decades preceding now, which has generally been focused on a relatively static industry of large light water reactors. So what that means is, you know, the, the requirements or the regulations were, were placed uh, in effect. They were largely, you know, the, the applications that have been received by the NRC up to now have largely been around large light water reactor technologies or light water reactor technologies. And so through the decades of that experience, they developed numerous guidance documents that help support how one licenses using the existing regulatory framework for light water reactors. And in some cases, the regulations uh, have therefore been formed prescriptively to address very specific concerns associated with light water reactor technology. So, so that's kind of what how the, the existing framework has been formed and found the foundation of it. That being said, a lot has been a lot of effort has been underway recently over the last several years uh, to bring forward key policy and technical issues that may be new or different for non-light water reactors, um, including evaluating the utility of the existing requirements and how those apply to non-light water reactor technology. Um, so while there are a number of topics that still remain open, a lot of progress has been made to help facilitate the licensing of uh, advanced reactor and advanced vision technologies, as well as specifically in our case, fast vision technologies. But there's still a lot of pre-existing requirements that, that have their bases founded in light water reactor technologies. So the onus is on us and things like a licensing project plan to really understand the existing framework, the existing requirements, what the, the staff at the time was really trying to assess um, from a safety perspective through those requirements and make sure that we're demonstrating that we're still meeting the intent in, in either a, a compliance space or another mechanism through you know, key design safety features that we've implemented. There is a thoughtful and, and detailed way that we can present information in a way that the, the regulator is used to seeing, which I know a lot of the efforts are focused on on that, which is, which is really great and a lot of progress have been made because of that. I will I'll also just highlight that just because fast reactor technologies 
isn't a technology that has been licensed in the US or commercialized in the US is actually a amazing technology that has been demonstrated for decades. In particular, the EBR2 reactor, the experimental breeder 2 reactor that was operated in the US. It was this amazing reactor that operated for decades. And there were these famous safety tests that were done on this reactor to ensure that it can demonstrate these, what is now known as passive safety characteristics, which is amazing. And in other words, what it means is without human intervention, the reactor can shut down automatically. Um, it doesn't require someone to physically go to a spot and physically press a button to enable safety. It relies on physics and science which you can't mess with. And so it's incredible what it was able to perform when it was undergoing these, these famous safety tests. And what I find very fascinating was that these operators would just sit back and allow this reactor, EBR2 reactor, to see how it would perform these safety tests. It's also called the heat removal tests. And what happened to the reactor was that it was able to function as predicted, as expected, continue to sell power affordably onto the, to the grid. It also demonstrated fuel recycling, which was a key aspect of this test reactor. And great to remind people that even though it's not a technology that has been licensed in the past, it did demonstrate and operate for such a long time, which provide us with a lot of great data and operational data that we can use in our licensing efforts now with the NRC. So with that said, the fact that we're trying to license such a unique reactor design, we did submit 200 key, topic, key topics that were different and that we have to do differently. Can you, can you share how the NRC responded to our novel licensing items? Yeah, you know, I want to echo some of the things you mentioned before, which are a, it's phenomenal to see a reactor that doesn't require that, that human action to ensure safety, but can instead rely on the really key and unique passive safety features and inherent features of fast reactor technology. Coming from a light water reactor as a, as a previously licensed senior reactor operator, it always baffles or, or astounds me rather that like this technology is so robust and so inherently safe that it doesn't require somebody licensed like myself necessarily to ensure that it's safe um, by, by navigating a a really intricate set of um, emergency operating procedures or abnormal, abnormal procedures. And, and to your point, our reactor design is unique. As you mentioned, there is a lot of really great operating experience uh, associated with um, certain portions of our technology that are really, um, that have been really demonstrated and that we can lean on that operating experience to help inform how we approach the safety basis for our future designs. So to, to specifically to your question, you know, the NRC staff has really been, um, receptive in a lot of ways. They, they want to um, they want to understand the, the motivation behind why um, some of these topics we've identified that, that look different from how previous uh, reactor facilities have been licensed and why we're taking no approaches. So generally their, their concerns aren't with the fact that, hey, this is different than what we've seen before. The root of their concern was always intended to be rooted in safety. So what they want to understand is if you're doing it differently, how do we know that you're meeting the key safety construct and the foundation that we've leaned on before? And in a lot of ways, we, that's, that forces us to go back um, to help translate the, the specific safety basis of our technology in how you know, the NRC staff is used to seeing it from the safety basis of light water reactor technology. And sometimes that's different. Sometimes that creates you know, a, little more, a, a little more effort on our part because we have to kind of do our, do our demonstration of translating what, you know, what the staff is, is consistently or what the staff has consistently seen before and what that means for for our technologies and how that, that can afford the ability for us to do things differently. And in a lot of ways, the staff has really been receptive to that. And, and in some ways, the staff is still, still looking for some of those safety basis items. And we're, we're happy to provide them, you know, provide those, those items for them so they can, they can make the right decisions that they need to make. And as I mentioned before, they're, they're in some ways evaluating some of these on a more general basis or a generic basis. And we've seen even, even, Beyond the review of our application, we've seen certain items that, that we had raised as unique licensing topics in our application transcend into generic licensing efforts um, to help support and facilitate you know, either streamline reviews of advanced reactor technologies or mm -hmm. um, 
you know, or in the establishment of guidance that helps reflect the inherent safety basis of these new technologies. That's great to hear. And thank you for providing that context. I, I do want to bring up the fact that when we submitted our combined license application back in 2020, it was during a time where we submitted the license application during the onset of the pandemic, which forced us to have to switch gears and transition to virtual and remote communications. What we had in mind was not the world would be faced with having to do with the global pandemic. So we, we have planned in terms of auditing was that a lot of the auditing process and experience would be done in person. Uh, we were not able to do that. I think we did a very successful job trying to transition in trying to transfer information virtually. But that said, you can't take being in person and the different components of being able to turn around and or read someone's body language to clarify, oh, was that not clear? Can I clarify that further, right? So how have that changed our approach in terms of sharing information? When we had submitted the license application, we had to do it virtually, but now we're able to do a lot of this, these meetings in person again, which is really excellent and great. We have already hosted the NRC at our offices a few times. We've gone there multiple times, but now that it's, we've transitioned back to in person, but also it's now we're seeing a combination of both. We're doing some person meetings and then some virtual meetings. How are you finding that? You know, a lot of the structure that we had developed in pre-application prior to the submittal of the Aurora Combined License application was intended to be utilizing more in-person interactions, in-person auditing, which obviously in the face of the, the global pandemic, we weren't able to actually implement, which did challenge some of the communication pathways we had originally relied upon um, to be, you know, really key in the review of that, that application. So as we've as we've moved through um, the last several years, we've we've taken a lot of those lessons learned from our perspective, fed them back into two really tangible ways. One is establishing a more a more robust communication pathway for key technical information and the way that we can share that with the the agency and the NRC staff, so that we can we have you know maybe non audit based material that, that folks can uh, rely upon and read through and peruse and, and understand to get you know better basis for the information we're providing as well as really leaning into those in-person interactions again now that we're able to have them this hybrid environment allows us to do a little bit of both where we can have really quick iterative conversations in a virtual space and get direct feedback you know especially you know top to bottom management to staff level and allow us to really iterate quickly on the feedback that we're receiving whereas we can also present information in a really technical way um, in, intentionally in person so that we can have that engineer to engineer conversation that, that really, I think we found beneficial early in pre-application and we're having again, where, where we can get folks in the same room and have the conversations really understand, um, the, the questions the, the, the NRC staff are raising so that we can provide the feedback that we need to, to help them support their reviews. I'm really glad to hear that things are going really well and that a combination of both it's likely working out much better than just 100% virtual communications with, with the NRC. So thank you. Thank you for that update. And getting to my, my final question, earlier this year, our application, our historic application, which was the first of its kind to be submitted to, to the NRC, which they had accepted and docketed for review, huge milestone. They essentially kicked it back to us. They need a little bit more information. So now that we have submitted our licensing project plan, outlining what we're going to submit and support our future applications, do you think that the license project plan can help us prepare for an effective and efficient application review? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think this, this hits on some of the earlier comments. So as you mentioned, you know, the NRC had, had returned it and we're excited about now taking the feedback that we provided and incorporating that into an updated application. The licensing project plan itself is allow, allows us to really figure out key, key topics that both we have an interest in engaging on in advance of submitting an application, as well as that the NRC has recognized as key topic areas that they, they still have open questions on. This allows us to align on those things, identify the right mechanism for providing early information to the NRC staff so that we can make sure that when we submit an application, 
there's no questions about how we're handling certain topics that, that are of interest, but the NRC staff is on the same page as we are in terms of what we're trying to provide in an actual application, how we're uh, how we're handling very key technical items that the staff is going to be interested in as they review our application. By aligning on those things, that should allow for a really streamlined acceptance review when we come to resubmit, as well as the actual application review space will have covered a lot of ground on a lot of topics and we'll have documented that and, and in pre-application so that when we get to those topics in actual review space, the staff and OPLO will have an understanding of what the path forward is exactly on those, those key topics. I'm excited to keep following your work and thank you again for taking this time to deep dive on, on all the layers that's happening within the licensing space. Thanks again, Ross. No, absolutely. Again, thank you, Anita, for having me.